some famous rejections. The girl doesn't, it seems to me, have a special perception or feeling which would lift that book above the curiosity level. From the rejection slip for The Diary of Anne Frank Everyone who has ever made it to the top has had to endure rejections. You just have to realize that they are not personal. Consider the following. Angie Everhart, who started modeling at the age of 16, was once told by model agency owner Eileen Ford that she would never make it as a model. Why not? Redheads don't sell. Everhart later became the first redhead in history to appear on the cover of Glamour magazine, had a great modeling career, and then went on to appear in 27 films and numerous TV shows. Novelist Stephen King almost made a multi-million dollar mistake when he threw his Carrie manuscript into the garbage because he was tired of the 30 rejections he had received. We are not interested in science fiction which deals with negative utopias, he was told. They do not sell. Luckily, his wife fished it out of the garbage. Eventually, Carrie was printed by another publisher, sold more than four million copies, and was made into a blockbuster film. In 1998, Google co-founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page approached Yahoo and suggested a merger. Yahoo could have snapped up the company for a handful of stock, but instead they suggested that the young Googlers keep working on their little school project and come back when they had grown up. Within five years, Google had an estimated market capitalization of $20 billion. At the time of this writing, Forbes reported Google's market capitalization at $268.45 billion. Even the first Harry Potter book, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, was rejected by 12 publishers before it found a home. Because she didn't give up, J.K. Rowling is now one of the richest people in England, with a net worth near $1 billion. Steven Spielberg applied and was rejected two times by the prestigious USC Film School. He ended up at Cal State University in Long Beach. He later went on to produce and direct some of the greatest blockbuster movies of all time, E.T., Lincoln, Saving Private Ryan, Jurassic Park, Jaws, The Color Purple, and Raiders of the Lost Ark, ultimately giving Spielberg a net worth of $3 billion. Twenty-seven years later, after Spielberg had become famous, USC awarded him an honorary doctoral degree, and two years after that he became a trustee of the university. Susan Story Twice in her life, Susan Mobbett's entire future was changed by the generous acts of people who didn't even know her. The first time it happened was just days after she was born. Her birth mother did what may have been the only kind thing she could have done for her at the time. Instead of abandoning her in the grassland to die, she placed her in a crowded market where she knew that she'd be found. That simple act saved her life. A woman named Monica found her. Monica had virtually no money and already had eight children to care for, but she couldn't turn away from Susan's cries. She picked her up and cared for her, and for weeks she brought her back to the market hoping to find her mother. Ultimately, she knew she never would. As poor as she was, Monica somehow found a way to make Susan her ninth. While Monica's love for her saved her life and gave her the hope that she could grow up and become anything she desired, she also knew firsthand the realities of growing up as a girl in the Maasai Mara region of Kenya. Most girls were married off to older men while they were still girls. They'd get pregnant at an age when their young bodies were not meant to bear children, and many didn't survive childbirth. For these girls, there was no time for studies. Their days were filled with walking for hours just to fetch filthy water for their family, and when they got home, new chores awaited them. The tiny fraction of girls in Kenya who were lucky enough to get an education seemed like the chosen few. Too few were able to escape that vicious cycle. Yet from a young age, Susan knew that education was her only way out of a life that the vast majority of women in her village had known for generations. And her only hope was Kisarune Secondary School, 
the first and only boarding school for girls near her village. That first year, the newly built school, funded by Cynthia Kersey's Unstoppable Foundation, announced that it would accept only 40 girls from the entire region. So Susan studied hard in primary school, and because she was at the top of all of her classes, she was confident and hopeful she would be accepted. She applied to Kisaruni and waited eagerly for the response. The last day of primary school, her heart was pounding because she knew she'd get the news of her future that day. When her teacher told her that she had not been accepted to Kisaruni, it felt like a death sentence. The night before the doors were to open at Kisaruni that year, young Susan lay awake, unable to sleep knowing that somewhere forty girls were excitedly lying awake anticipating their first day at school. They were probably preparing their black and red school uniforms and looking forward to meeting new friends. But she had been condemned to a life of poverty in her village. But Susan was not willing to let go of her dream of a better life that easily. The next morning she set out on foot toward Kisaruni, miles away on a dusty path. As she approached the school, she could see the forty lucky girls in their bright uniforms laughing and playing. As Susan arrived, everyone turned to look at her. The principal approached her and asked why she was there. Though Susan was terrified, she bravely said that she had been turned down by the school, but needed to hear it directly from her because she simply couldn't believe it. The principal gently explained that they had room for only forty girls. That meant forty beds, forty desks, and forty chairs. Unfortunately, Susan was the forty-first girl. She tried not to cry. She tried to be brave. But the tears rolled down her dusty cheeks, and she could not imagine how she would be able to walk home. As she gathered her strength to leave, the forty girls began to surround her. One girl shouted, Please don't make her go away. We'll move our beds together. Another girl pleaded, I'll share my desk with her. Another shouted, I'll share my books with her. Please don't make her go. The girls surrounded her in what felt like a circle of protection, not allowing her to move. She was stunned. The girls' generosity that day allowed Susan to attend school that year. And later, when the Unstoppable Foundation and a generous donor heard of Susan's bravery, how she had refused to believe she couldn't go to school, they paid her tuition, making it possible for Susan to continue her studies and become Kisaruni's 41st girl. Let Susan's story of perseverance in the face of rejection inspire you to never count yourself out. Believe you will succeed. Do everything in your power and never give up. Principle 19. Use feedback to your advantage. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. Ken Blanchard and Spencer Johnson, co-authors of The One Minute Manager. Once you begin to take action, you'll start getting feedback about whether you're doing the right thing. You'll get data, advice, help, suggestions, direction, and even criticism that will help you constantly adjust and move forward while continually enhancing your knowledge, abilities, attitudes, and relationships. By asking for feedback is really only the first part of the equation. Once you receive feedback, you have to be willing to respond to it. There are two kinds of feedback. There are two kinds of feedback you might encounter, negative and positive. We tend to prefer the positive. That is, results, money, praise, a raise, a promotion, satisfied customers, awards, happiness, inner peace, intimacy, pleasure. It feels better. It tells us that we are on course, that we are doing the right thing. We tend not to like negative feedback, lack of results, little or no money, criticism, poor evaluations, being passed over for a raise or a promotion, complaints, unhappiness, inner conflict, loneliness, pain. However, there is as much useful data in negative feedback as there is in positive feedback. It tells us that we are off course, headed in the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing. That is also valuable information. 
In fact, it's so valuable that one of the most useful projects you could undertake is to change how you feel about negative feedback. I like to refer to negative feedback as information about improvement opportunities. The world is telling me where and how I can improve what I am doing. Here is a place I can get better. Here is where I can correct my behavior to get even closer to what I want. More money, more sales, a promotion, a better relationship, better grades, or more success on the athletic field. To reach your goals more quickly, you need to welcome, receive, and embrace all the feedback that comes your way. On course, off course, on course, off course. There are many ways to respond to feedback, some of which work, they take you closer to your stated objectives, and some of which don't. They keep you stuck or take you even further from your goals. When I conduct trainings on the success principles, I illustrate this point by asking for a volunteer from the audience to stand at the far side of the room. The volunteer represents the goal I want to reach. My task is to walk across the room to where he is standing. If I get to where he is standing, I have successfully reached my goal. I instruct the volunteer to act as a constant feedback-generating machine. Every time I take a step, he is to say, on course, if I am walking directly toward him, and off course, if I am walking even the slightest bit off to either side. Then I begin to walk very slowly toward the volunteer. Every time I take a step directly toward him, the volunteer says, on course. Every few steps, I purposely veer off course, and the volunteer says, off course. I immediately correct my direction. Every few steps, I veer off course again, and then correct again in response to his off-course feedback. After a lot of zigzagging, I eventually reach my goal, and give the person a hug for volunteering. I ask the audience to tell me which feedback the volunteer gave me more often, on-course or off-course. The answer is always off-course. And here is the interesting point. I was off course more than I was on course, and I still got there, just by continually taking action and constantly adjusting to the feedback. The same is true in life. All we have to do is to start to take action and then respond to the feedback. If we do that diligently enough and long enough, we will eventually get to our goals and achieve our dreams. Ways of Responding to Feedback That Don't Work Though there are many ways you can respond to feedback, some responses simply don't work. 1. Caving in and quitting As part of the seminar exercise I described above, I will repeat the process of walking toward my goal. However, in this round I will purposely veer off course, and when my volunteer keeps repeating off course over and over, I break down and cry. I can't take it anymore. Life is too hard. I can't take all this negative criticism. I quit. How many times have you or someone you know received negative feedback and simply caved in over it? All that does is keep you stuck in the same place. Of course, it's easier not to cave in when you receive feedback if you remember that feedback is simply information. Think of it as correctional guidance instead of criticism. Think of the automatic pilot system on an airplane. The system is constantly telling the plane that it has gone too high, too low, too far to the right, or too far to the left. The plane just keeps correcting in response to the feedback it is receiving. It doesn't all of a sudden freak out and break down because of the relentless flow of feedback. Stop taking feedback so personally. It is just information designed to help you adjust and get to the goal a whole lot faster. 2. Getting mad at the source of the feedback. Once again, I will begin walking toward the other end of the room while purposely veering off course, causing the volunteer to say, off course, over and over. This time, I put one hand on my hip, stick out my chin, point my finger and yell, bitch, bitch, bitch. All you ever do is criticize me. You're so negative. Why can't you ever say anything positive? Think about it. How many times have you reacted with anger and hostility towards someone who was giving you feedback that was genuinely useful? 
All it does is push the person and the feedback away. 3. Ignoring the feedback For my third demonstration, imagine me putting my fingers in my ears and determinedly walking off course. The volunteer might be saying, Off course! Off course! But I can't hear anything because my fingers are in my ears. Not listening to or ignoring the feedback is another response that doesn't work. We all know people who tune out everyone's point of view but their own. They are simply not interested in what other people think. They don't want to hear anything anyone else has to say. The sad thing is, feedback could significantly transform their lives if only they would listen and respond. So as you can see, when someone gives you feedback, there are three possible reactions that don't work. One, crying, falling apart, caving in, and giving up. Two, getting angry at the source of the feedback. And three, ignoring the feedback. Crying and falling apart is simply ineffective. It may temporarily release whatever emotions you have built up in your system, but it takes you out of the game. It immobilizes you. It may stop the flow of negative feedback, but it doesn't get you the information you need to reach your goal. You can't win in the game of life if you are not on the playing field. Getting angry at the person giving you the feedback is equally ineffective. It just makes the source of the valuable feedback attack you back or simply go away. What good is that? It may temporarily make you feel better, but it doesn't help you become more successful. In my advanced trainings and in our Train the Trainer program, when everyone knows the other participants fairly well, I have the whole group stand up, mill around, and ask as many people as possible the following question. How do you see me limiting myself? After doing this for 30 minutes, people sit down and record what they have heard. You'd think that this would be hard to listen to for 30 minutes, but it is such valuable feedback that people are actually grateful for the opportunity to become aware of their limiting beliefs and behaviors and replace them with more effective beliefs and behaviors. Everyone then develops an action plan for transcending their limiting behavior. Remember, feedback is simply information. You don't have to take it personally. Just welcome it and use it. The most intelligent and productive response is to say, Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for caring enough to tell me what you see and how you feel. I appreciate it. Be willing to ask for feedback. Most people will not voluntarily give you feedback. They are as uncomfortable with possible confrontation as you are. They don't want to hurt your feelings. They are afraid of your reaction. They don't want to risk your disapproval. So, to get honest and open feedback, you're going to need to ask for it. And make it safe for the person to give it to you. In other words, don't shoot the messenger. And don't argue with them. Just say, thank you. A powerful question to ask your family members, friends, and colleagues is, How do you see me limiting myself? You might think that the answers would be hard to listen to. But most people find the information so valuable that they are grateful for what people tell them. Armed with this new feedback, you can create a plan of action for replacing your limiting beliefs and behaviors with more effective and productive beliefs and behaviors. Most people are afraid to ask for corrective feedback because they are afraid of what they are going to hear. But you're better off knowing the truth than not knowing the truth. Once you know it, you can do something about it. You cannot fix what you don't know is broken. You cannot improve your life, your relationships, your game, or your performance without feedback. When you avoid asking for feedback, you are the only one who is not in on the secret. The other person is usually already told their spouse, their friends, their parents, their business associates, and other potential customers what they are dissatisfied with. They should be telling you but they are unwilling to do so for fear of your reaction. As a result, you are being deprived of the very thing you need to improve your relationship, your product, your service, your teaching, your managing, or your parenting. 
you must do two things to remedy this. First, you must intentionally and actively solicit feedback. Ask your partner, your friends, your colleagues, your boss, your employees, your clients, your parents, your teachers, your students, and your coaches. Second, you must be grateful for the feedback. Do not get defensive. Just say, thank you for caring enough to share that with me. Remember, feedback is a gift that helps you become more effective. Be grateful for it. Get your head out of the sand and ask, ask, ask. Then check in with yourself to see what fits for you and put the useful feedback into action. Take whatever steps are necessary to improve the situation, including changing your own behavior. The most valuable question you may ever learn. In the 1980s, a multimillionaire businessman taught me a question that radically changed the quality of my life. If the only thing you get out of reading this book is the consistent use of this question in your personal and business life, it will have been worth the money and time you have invested. So what is this magical question that can improve the quality of every relationship you are in, every product you produce, every service you deliver, every meeting you conduct, every class you teach, and every transaction you enter into? Here it is. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the quality of our relationship, service or product, during the last week, two weeks, or month, or quarter, or semester? or season. Here are a number of variations on the same question that have served me well over the years. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the meeting we just had? Me as a manager. Me as a parent. Me as a teacher. This class. This meal. My cooking. Our sex life. This deal. This book. Any answer less than a 10 gets this follow-up question. What would it take to make it a 10? This is where the valuable information comes from. Knowing that a person is dissatisfied is not enough. Knowing in detail what will satisfy them gives you the information you need to do what is necessary to create a winning product, service, or relationship. Make it a habit to end every project, meeting, class, training, consultation, and installation with the two questions. Make it a weekly ritual. I ask my wife these same two questions every Sunday night. Here is a typical scenario. How would you rate the quality of our relationship this past week? Eight. What would it take to make it a ten? Come to bed at the same time with me at least four nights a week. Come in for dinner on time or call me and tell me you're going to be late. I hate sitting here waiting and wondering. Let me finish a joke I am telling without interrupting and talking over because you think you can tell it better. Put your dirty laundry in the clothes hamper instead of in a pile on the floor. I ask my assistants this question every Friday afternoon. Here is one response I received one Friday. Six. Whoa. What would it take to make it a ten? We were supposed to have a meeting this week to go over my quarterly review, but it got pushed aside by other matters. It makes me feel unimportant and that you don't care about me as much as the other people around here. The other thing is that I feel you are not using me enough. You are not delegating anything but the simple stuff to me. I want more responsibility. I want you to trust me more with the important stuff. This job has become boring and uninteresting. I want more of a challenge. This was not easy to hear, but it was true, and it led to two wonderful results. It helped me delegate more important stuff to her, and thus cleared my plate, giving me more free time. And it also created a happier assistant who was able to serve me and the company better. It pays to ask. When Mark Victor Hansen and I decided to compile stories for Chicken Soup for the African-American Soul, I asked Lisa Nichols to co-author the book with us. Lisa was the founder and CEO of Motivating the Teen Spirit, which she started to empower teens to fall madly in love with themselves. 
In recent years, she has expanded her mission to include people of all ages, because she believes that all of us deserve to fall in love with the person we see in the mirror every morning. Lisa later went on to have a featured role in the movie The Secret, and has authored several books of her own, including No Matter What and Unbreakable Spirit. Over the course of working on two different books together, Lisa and I became close friends. She told me that one of the best things to come out of our relationship is the on the scale of one to ten question. After first hearing about this technique, she instantly began to use it with her son, Julani, who was eleven years old at the time. She had been feeling really guilty about being separated from him so much due to her work. The first time she asked him to rate their relationship, Julani gave it a seven. Hmm, she thought. Not terrible, but it sure could be better. Taking a deep breath, she asked, What would it take? To make it a ten? He said, I want to see you more. I want to travel with you. She immediately took this to heart and committed to find a way to make it happen. First, she enrolled him in a private school, with the condition that Julani be able to distance learn when he traveled with her. The school administrator said, We've never done that before. Lisa told them, I'm excited that we get to co-create a new possibility. The school agreed to try it, and for the next two years, Julani traveled with her whenever he wanted to. She'd show him her travel calendar six months in advance, and he'd choose a place that he wanted to go. Eventually, he said, Mom, I'm ready to stay at home. They had handled that particular part of improving their relationship. When Julani was 17, she asked him the 1 to 10 feedback question while they were watching movies at home together. He said, Oh, Mom, this again? She repeated the question. He said, I'd rate it a nine. She asked, What would it take to make it go from a nine to a ten? He sat there and thought. Finally, he said, I can't think of anything. But it seems so weird to say it's a ten. That would make it perfect. She said, Okay, so if it's not perfect, what would make it a ten? Julani said, All I can think of is sitting on the couch, watching movies with you, our feet touching, and cooking with you. We're doing all that now, but it still feels weird to say it's a ten. In that moment, she felt her heart swell up with love. She told me, I don't care how many stages I stand on, how many millions of people that I speak in front of, how much wealth I generate. The most important thing to me is the relationship I have with my son. It's beyond price. You gave me a tool to monitor my son's needs, his desires, what he's getting, and what he's not getting. For that, I'll be forever grateful. How to Look Really Brilliant with Little Effort Virginia Satir, the author of the classic parenting book People Making, was probably the most successful and famous family therapist who ever lived. During her long and illustrious career, she was hired by the Michigan State Department of Social Services to provide a proposal on how to revamp and restructure the Department of Social Services so it would serve the client population better. Sixty days later, she provided the department with a 150-page report, which they said was the most amazing piece of work they had ever seen. This is brilliant, they gushed. How did you come up with all these ideas? She replied, Oh, I just went out to all the social workers in your system and asked them what it would take for the system to work better. Listen to the feedback. Human beings were given a left foot and a right foot to make a mistake first to the left, then to the right, left again, and repeat. Buckminster Fuller engineer, inventor, and philosopher. Whether we ask or not, feedback comes to us in various forms. It might come verbally from a colleague, or it might be a letter from the government. It might be the bank refusing your loan. Or it could be a special opportunity that comes your way because of a specific step you took. Whatever it is, it's important to listen to the feedback. Simply take a step and listen. Take another step and listen. If you hear, 
off course, take a step in a direction you believe may be on course, and listen. Listen externally to what others may be telling you, but also listen internally to what your body, your feelings, and your instincts may be telling you. Is your mind and body saying, I'm happy, I like this, this is the right job for me, or I'm weary, I'm emotionally drained, I don't like this as much as I thought, I don't have a good feeling about that guy. Whatever feedback you get, don't ignore the yellow alerts. Never go against your gut. If it doesn't feel right to you, it probably isn't. Is all feedback accurate? Not all feedback is useful or accurate. You must consider the source. Some feedback is polluted by the psychological distortions of the person giving you the feedback. For example, if your drunk husband tells you, You're a no good, ha ha that is probably not accurate or useful feedback. The fact that your husband is drunk and angry, however, is feedback you should listen to. Look for patterns. Additionally, you should look for patterns in the feedback you get. As my friend Jack Rosenblum likes to say, If one person tells you you're a horse, they're crazy. If three people tell you you're a horse, there's a conspiracy afoot. If ten people tell you you're a horse, it's time to buy a saddle. The point is that if several people are telling you the same thing, there is probably some truth in it. Why resist it? You may get to be right, but the question you have to ask yourself is, would I rather be right or be happy? Would I rather be right or be successful? I have a friend who would rather be right than be happy and successful. He got mad at anyone who tried to give him feedback. Don't you talk to me that way, young lady. This is my business and I'll run it the way I want to. I don't give a hoot what you think. He was a my way or the highway sort of person. He wasn't interested in anyone else's opinion or feedback. In the process, he alienated his wife, his two daughters, his clients, and all his employees. He ended up with two divorces, kids who didn't want to speak to him, and two bankrupt businesses. But he was right. Don't you get caught in this trap. It's a dead-end street. What feedback have you been receiving from your family, friends, members of the opposite sex, co-workers, boss, partners, clients, vendors, and your body that you may need to pay more attention to? Are there any patterns that stand out? Make a list, and next to each item, write an action step you can take to get back on course. What to do when the feedback tells you you failed. When all indicators say you've had a failure experience, there are a number of things you can do to respond appropriately and keep moving forward. 1. Acknowledge you did the best you could with the awareness, knowledge, and skills you had at the time. 2. Acknowledge that you survived and that you can absolutely cope with any and all of the consequences or results. 3. Write down all the insights and lessons you learned from the experience in a file in your computer or in a journal. Read through this file often. Ask others involved, your family, employees, clients, team, and others, what they learned. Then make a list under the heading, Ways to do it better next time. 4. Make sure to thank everyone for their feedback and their insights. If someone is hostile in the delivery of their feedback, Remember that it is an expression of their level of fear, not your level of incompetence or unlovability. Just take in the feedback, use whatever is applicable and valuable for the future, and discard the rest. 5. Clean up any messes that have been created and deliver any communications that are necessary to complete the experience, including any apologies or regrets that are due. Do not try to hide the failure. 6. Take some time to go back and review your successes. It's important to remind yourself that you have had many more successes than you have had failures. You've done many more things right than you've done wrong. 7. Regroup. Spend some time with positive, loving friends, family, and co-workers 
who can reaffirm your worth and your contribution. 8. Refocus on your vision. Incorporate the lessons learned, recommit to your original plan, or create a new plan of action and then get on with it. Stay in the game. Keep moving toward the fulfillment of your dreams. You're probably going to make a lot of mistakes along the way. Just dust yourself off, get back on your horse, and keep riding. Principle 20 Commit to constant and never-ending improvement. We have an innate desire to endlessly learn, grow, and develop. We want to become more than what we already are. Once we yield to this inclination for continuous and never-ending improvement, we lead a life of endless accomplishments and satisfaction. Chuck Galozzi, author of The Three Thieves and Four Pillars of Happiness In Japan, the word for constant and never-ending improvement is Kaizen. Not only is this an operating philosophy for modern Japanese businesses, it is also the age-old philosophy of warriors, too, and it's become the personal mantra of millions of successful people. Achievers, whether in business, sports, or the arts, are committed to continual improvement. If you want to be more successful, you need to learn to ask yourself, how can I make this better? How can I do it more efficiently? How can I do this more profitably? How can we serve our customers better? How can I provide more value to more people? How can we do this with greater love? The Mind-Numbing Pace of Change In today's world, a certain amount of improvement is necessary just to keep up with the rapid pace of change. New technologies are announced nearly every month. New manufacturing techniques are discovered even more often. New words come into use any time a trend or fad catches on. And what we learn about ourselves, about our health, and about the capacity for human thought continues almost unabated. Improving is therefore necessary simply to survive. But to thrive, as successful people do, a more dedicated approach to improvement is required. Improve in small increments. Whenever you set out to improve your skills, change your behavior, or better your family life or business, beginning in small, manageable steps gives you a greater chance of long-term success. Doing too much too fast not only overwhelms you or anyone else involved in the improvement, it can doom the effort to failure thereby reinforcing the belief that it's difficult, if not impossible, to succeed. When you start with small, achievable steps you can easily master, it reinforces your belief that you can easily improve. Decide what to improve on. At work, your goal might be for your company to improve the quality of your product or service, your customer service program, your online marketing, or your advertising. Professionally, you might want to improve your computer skills, your sales skills, or your negotiating skills. At home, you might want to improve your parenting skills, communication skills, or cooking skills. You could also focus on improving your health and fitness, your knowledge of investing and money management, or your musical ability. Or perhaps you want to develop greater inner peace through meditation, yoga, and prayer. Whatever your goal. Decide where you want to improve and what steps you'll need to take to achieve that improvement. Is it learning a new skill? Perhaps you can find that in a night class at the local community college. If it's improving your service to the community, perhaps you can find a way to spend an extra hour per week volunteering. To keep yourself focused on constant and never-ending improvement, ask yourself every day, How can I, or we, improve today? What can I, or we, do better than before? Where can I learn a new skill or develop a new competency? If you do, you'll embark on a lifelong journey of improvement that will ensure your success. You can't skip steps. He who stops being better stops being good. Oliver Cromwell, British politician and soldier, 
1599-1658. One of life's realities is that major improvements take time. They don't happen overnight. But because so many of today's products and services promise overnight perfection, we've come to expect instant gratification, and we've become discouraged when it doesn't happen. However, if you make a commitment to learning something new every day, getting just a little bit better every day, then eventually over time you will reach your goals. Becoming a master takes time. You have to practice, practice, practice. You have to hone your skills through constant use and refinement. It takes years to have the depth and breadth of experience that produces expertise, insight, and wisdom. Every book you read, every class you take, every experience you have is another building block in your career and your life. Don't shortchange yourself by not being ready when your big break appears. Make sure you have done your homework and honed your craft. Actors usually have to do a lot of preparation. Acting classes, community theater, off-Broadway plays, bit parts in movies and television, more acting classes, voice lessons, accent training, dancing lessons, martial arts training, learning to ride a horse, more bit parts, until one day they are ready for the dream part that is ready for them. Successful basketball players learn to shoot with their opposite hand improve their foul-throw shooting, and work on their three-point shots. Artists experiment with different media. Airline pilots train for every kind of emergency in a flight simulator. Doctors go back to school to learn new procedures and obtain advanced certifications. They are all engaged in a process of constant and never-ending improvement. Make a commitment to keep getting better and better every day in every way. If you do, you'll enjoy the feelings of increased self-esteem and self-confidence that come from self-improvement, as well as the ultimate success that will inevitably follow. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. John Maxwell, leadership expert, author of 60 books. The Power of the Slight Edge In his book, The Slight Edge, Jeff Olson talks about the compound effect over time of doing just a little bit more or a little bit less of something. Whether it's doing a little more each day, 20 push-ups, 20 minutes of meditation, 20 minutes of aerobics, 20 pages of reading, an extra hour of sleep, taking supplements, or a little less each day an hour less of television, one less glass of wine, one less four-dollar latte, or one less hour surfing the Internet. Over time, these little changes make a huge difference in your results. Think about these surprising facts. If you were to replace a sugary soft drink with a glass of water at lunch or during your afternoon break every day for a year, you would end up drinking almost 40 gallons of water. You'd avoid consuming close to 50,000 empty calories, the equivalent of fasting for 22 days, assuming you were eating 2,200 calories a day, and you'd save about $500 in expenses. If you were to cut out an hour of watching television a day, that 365 hours would add up to nine 40-hour work weeks. That's like adding an extra two months of productive time to your life every year. In 12 years, that would equal having two extra years of focused time. Whether you use that time to focus on writing your books, practicing your instrument, improving your sports performance, learning a new language, making more sales calls, marketing on the Internet, reading, exercising, doing yoga, meditating, or deepening your relationships is up to you. But imagine the difference it would make over time. Principle 21. Keep score for success. You have to measure what you want more of. Charles Coonrat, founder, The Game of Work. Remember when you were growing up and your mom or dad measured you every few months and kept track of your height on the wall near the pantry door? 
It was something visible that let you know where you stood in relation to the past and to your future goal, which was usually to be as tall as your mom or dad. It let you know you were making progress. It encouraged you to eat right and drink your milk to keep growing. Well, successful people keep the same kind of measurements. They keep score of exciting progress, positive behavior, financial gain, anything they want more of. In his groundbreaking book, The Game of Work, Charles Coonrat says that scorekeeping stimulates us to create more of the positive outcomes we're keeping track of. It actually reinforces the behavior that created these outcomes in the first place. Think about it. Your natural inclination is always to improve your score. If you were to keep score on the five things that would advance your personal and professional objectives the most, imagine how motivated you would be each time the numbers improved in your favor. Measure what you want, not what you don't want. We learn early in life that it's valuable to count what's valuable. We count the number of times we skip the rope, the number of jacks we pick up, the number of marbles we collect, the number of base hits we get in Little League, and the number of boxes of Girl Scout cookies we sell. Batting averages in baseball tell us the number of times we hit the ball, not the percentage of times we didn't. We keep score mostly of what is good, because that is what we want more of. When Mike Walsh at High Performers International wanted to increase his bottom line, he started keeping track not just of the number of enrollments his company was getting, but also of how many cold calls employees were making, how many face-to-face -face appointments they set up, and how many of those appointments they turned into enrollments. As a result of this kind of scorekeeping, Mike saw a 39% increase in revenues in just six months. Using Critical Drivers to Keep Score in Business Once you start counting what you want more of in your business, you can start to develop benchmarks that you know will boost revenue, profits, and market share. In every business, there is a checklist of goals and targets that, when reached, surpassed, and improved upon, will continually drive revenue and increase profits. These targets are called critical drivers. If you're in insurance or banking, for example, your critical drivers might be the number of cross-sells per customer or the number of loan originations. For a training company, an important critical driver would be the number of opt-ins for your free report. Whatever your critical drivers might be, the key is to inspire, motivate, and empower your team to continually identify, track, measure, and meet those benchmarks even being accountable to meeting the critical drivers every week. Once you get to that level of keeping score, you will see rapid progress happening in your business. If you are looking to rapidly increase your business revenues, Janet Switzer has several programs that help business owners establish revenue generation systems that include critical drivers so your staff stays focused on activity that increases profits and growth. To learn more, visit www.janetswitzer.com. Not just for business owners anymore. When Tyler Williams joined a junior basketball league, his father, Rick Williams, co-author of Managing the Obvious, decided to counteract the usual negative focus of youth sports by creating a parent scorecard to keep track of what Tyler did right rather than what he did wrong. He tracked seven contributions his son could make to the team's success. Points, rebounds, assists, steals, block shots, and so on. And awarded Tyler one point every time he made one of those positive plays. Whereas the statistics kept by the coaches centered chiefly on points and rebounds, the two traditional forms of measurement used in junior basketball. Tyler's dad's scorecard awarded points for virtually everything positive accomplished during a game. It wasn't long before Tyler was sprinting over during timeouts to check on his contribution points. When they reached home after the game, Tyler would hustle to his bedroom, where he had a chart on the wall that plotted his progress. With a simple graph Tyler made himself, he could see where he was improving. As the season progressed, the line on his graph went steadily upward. 
Without a single harsh word from his coach or his dad, Tyler had turned into a better basketball player and enjoyed the process besides. Keeping Score at Home Of course, scorekeeping isn't just for business, sports, and school. It can be applied to your personal life, too. In the May 2000 issue of Fast Company magazine, Vinod Kosla, the founding CEO of Sun Microsystems, said, It's great to know how to recharge your batteries, but it's even more important to make sure that you actually do it. I track how many times I get home in time to have dinner with my family. My assistant reports the exact number to me each month. I have four kids, ages 7 to 11. Spending time with them is what keeps me going. Your company measures its priorities. People also need to place metrics around their priorities. I spend about 50 hours a week at work, and I could easily work 100 hours. So I always make sure that, at the end of it all, I get home in time to eat with my kids. Then I help them with their homework and play games with them. My goal is to be home for dinner at least 25 nights a month. Having a target number is key. I know people in my business who are lucky if they make it home five nights a month. I don't think that I'm any less productive than those people. Decide where you need to keep score in order to manifest your vision and achieve your goals. Then post your scores where you and any others playing the game can easily see them. Principle 22 Practice Persistence Most people give up just when they're about to achieve success. They quit on the one-yard line. They give up at the last minute of the game, one foot from a winning touchdown. H. Ross Perot, American billionaire and former U.S. presidential candidate. Persistence is probably the single most common quality of high achievers. They simply refuse to give up. The longer you hang in there, the greater the chance that something will happen in your favor. No matter how hard it seems, the longer you persist, the more likely your success. It's not always going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to have to persist in the face of obstacles, oftentimes unseen obstacles, that no amount of planning or forethought could have predicted. Sometimes you'll encounter what seem like overwhelming odds. And sometimes, the universe will test your commitment to the goal you're pursuing. The going may be hard, requiring you to refuse to give up while you learn new lessons, develop new parts of yourself, and make difficult decisions. History has demonstrated that the most notable winners usually encountered heartbreaking obstacles before they triumphed. They won because they refused to become discouraged by their defeats. B.C. Forbes, founder of Forbes magazine. Hugh Panero, the co-founder and former CEO of XM Satellite Radio, is an example of amazing commitment and perseverance in the corporate sector. After two years recruiting investors ranging from General Motors and Hughes Electronics to DirecTV and Clear Channel Communications, Panero's dream of becoming the world's largest subscription radio service nearly collapsed at the last minute when investors threatened to back out if an acceptable deal wasn't struck by midnight June 6, 2001. After exhausting negotiations and shuttled diplomacy, Panero and his chairman of the board, Gary Parsons, secured commitments of $225 million just minutes before the deadline. Less than a year later, the launch of one of XM's $200 million satellites was aborted just 11 seconds before liftoff, when an engineer misread a message on his computer screen, forcing the company to wait for the next available launch date two months later. Still, Panero persevered and finally scheduled the debut of XM Radio's 101 channels of programming for September 12, 2001. But when terrorists attacked the World Trade Center on the morning of September 11th, just a day prior to the scheduled debut, Panero was forced to cancel the satellite's launch party and pull XM's inaugural TV ad featuring a rap star rocketing past a group of towering skyscrapers. 
Panero's team urged him to postpone the company's launch for another year. Yet in the end, Panero held fast to his dream and debuted the service just two weeks later. Today, through all the setbacks and delays, most of which make our own daily difficulties pale by comparison, the merged Sirius XM dominates the satellite radio business with more than 23 million subscribers paying every month to enjoy 72 channels of music plus 93 channels of premier sports, talk, comedy, children's and entertainment programming, and traffic and weather information. Five years. No is a word on your path to yes. Don't give up too soon. Not even if well-meaning parents, relatives, friends, and colleagues tell you to get a real job. Your dreams are your real job. Joyce Spicer, author of Rejections of the Written Famous. When Debbie McComer decided to pursue her dream of becoming a writer, she rented a typewriter, put it on the kitchen table, and began typing each morning after the kids went off to school. When the kids came home, she moved the typewriter and made them dinner. When they went to bed, she moved it back and typed some more. For two and a half years, Debbie followed this routine. Supermom had become a struggling writer, and she was loving every minute of it. One night, however, her husband Wayne sat her down and said, Honey, I'm sorry, but you're not bringing in any income. We can't do this anymore. We can't survive on just what I make. That night, her heart broken and her mind too busy to let her sleep, she stared at the ceiling in their darkened bedroom. Debbie knew, with all the responsibilities of keeping up a house and taking four kids to sports, church, and scouts, that working forty hours a week would leave her no time to write. Sensing her despair, her husband woke up and asked, What's wrong? I really think I could have made it as a writer. I really do. Wayne was silent for a long time, then sat up, turned on the light, and said, All right, honey, go for it. So Debbie returned to her dream and her typewriter on the kitchen table, pounding out page after page for another two and a half years. Her family went without vacations, pinched pennies, and wore hand-me-downs. But the sacrifice and the persistence finally paid off. After five years of struggling, Debbie sold her first book, then another, and another. Until finally, today, Debbie has published more than 150 books, many of which have become New York Times bestsellers, and four of which have become made-for-television movies. Over 170 million copies of her books are in print, and she has millions of loyal fans. And Wayne? All that sacrifice in support of his wife paid off handsomely. He got to retire at age 50, and now spends his time building an airplane in the basement of their 7,000-square-foot mansion. Debbie's kids got a gift far more important than a few summer camps. As adults, they realize what Debbie gave them was far more important, permission and encouragement to pursue their own dreams. What could you accomplish if you were to follow your heart, practice this much daily discipline, and never give up?